You know, we think about the things that we have to be thankful to God for, and today I want to talk about one of the things, and, and continuing what we were talking about last week, and it's about Scripture. We need and ought to be very, very thankful that we have Scripture, because Scripture changes our life. It is who we are. In fact, as I was sitting there and Jeanette was singing the song, I was reminded of what, this is actually John chapter 10, in verse 34, where it talks about what Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? We think about Jesus being sent into our world and that he brings us scripture and that he supports scripture. And today I want to, again, review some of the things that we talked about last week, but I want to go into more, a little more depth than that because of its importance in all of our life. Scripture is important every day in our life, leading, guiding, and directing us. And today I'm just going to focus on the central part of, of 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, where we read last week uh, where... Of the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, talking about how from his infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And there is a wisdom for salvation as opposed to wisdom that the world lives in through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we read a little earlier what Paul wrote to the church at Rome, that we who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. We ought to help one another. We help you know, each other in understanding scripture. So when we look at this, scripture directs us on how to live in this world. Because the world has a script for us on how to live. And there are all kinds of books written on how to live life, how to be happy, how to be successful, all of these things. And when we look at scripture, some of those things absolutely contradicts what God says that we, how we ought to, to live our life. And scripture is more than man's writing. We were talking about that last week, and this is what Timothy is being told by the Apostle Paul, that it's God breathed. And then another part of this, and this is where we can tend to fall very, very short on this, is that scripture has authority in our life. And uh, we, we live, according to scripture, it has a basis for authority. And that scripture connects us to God. And we have to understand and appreciate that. And as he says here to Timothy, that it is holy. And so with that thought in mind, Let's take a look at how we respond to that, what God has to tell us in terms of, of being holy. And I want to, again, I'm reading scripture, and in this case, I'm reading what the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Now, you'll see that you have, a lot, you have lots and lots of scriptures today, and I was having an interesting conversation with another pastor this week. He was talking about, well, you know, having one scripture, one section of, of verses, and sticking with, with that. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. But sometimes, in order to explain the context and the overarching uh, understanding that you have, it is more than just taking one scripture. It is expanding it to give you kind of a worldview, a whole Bible of view, because we, we can get ourselves focused sometimes that we, we miss the other part of, the, of this. So in 1 Peter, though, chapter 1 and verse 15, he, he writes this to us, but just as he who called you is holy. Now there's, uh, there's a understanding that we have that we are called of God. Scripture helps us to know that, 
And not only does scripture help us to know that, also Jesus helps us to know that, and God, the Holy Spirit, helps us to know that. So we are called, just called you to holy, who has called you, so be holy in all you do. Not just in a little bit, but in everything that we do. We live in a world that has a tendency to compartmentalize things. And while on the one hand we may be holy on Sunday or whenever we go to church or for that period of time, but we are called to be holy in all that we do. For, and now notice here, Peter is not just attaching this as an idea of his own. And this is also a discussion that we were having this past week, is that the ideas, the principles by which we live, and even the, the great sayings that we might live by that other people have, have uh, said, and I was reading one from Abraham Lincoln, you're just about as happy as you choose to be. And it's, it's a matter of choice. But when we think about being happy, uh, without scripture, we would not have we would not have the understanding that Jesus gives us. For example, I've come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. Without scripture, we would not understand that the things that we suffered. There's a reason. There's a purpose behind this. That all who live godly shall suffer persecution. That all of His sons He will correct, uh, because no matter who we are. We have to be corrected. Um, if I know that sometimes as, as pastors, we, we can live in a kind of a sterile environment, that we can control those things around us. And in controlling those things around us, we never take a stupid pill, as a friend of mine put it. Because we got, and that's what the scribes and Pharisees did. They controlled everything around them, and they, they felt like they had everything right. However, when you're out there living life, as people are living life, and as Jesus comes, it is easy to take a stupid pill. Anybody here ever done anything stupid once or twice? In fact, as I was telling my wife, I've been back to the pharmacy a couple times to get some refills on my stupid pills. <laughs> So, you know, and you know what makes me stupid oftentimes is people and myself. But I'm not blaming them. But when, when we live in situations, it's like it's kind of stupid to cuss somebody out, to cut you off and all of that and curse them and all those things. It's, it's kind of, and, get, and get all mad and get all upset and get in a rage and do something stupid. But we've done it. Yeah. We show up at God sometimes, at, at God's place, and do something stupid. Like, don't show up with our heart. Just sh- show up with our hand out. I think there's, there's a lot of, it's like, well, why are you here, you know? What are you doing? There, there are just lessons in life for us to learn. He says, again, for it is written, be holy, because, because I am holy. So this is what scripture tells us. Now, scripture also tells us and helps us in terms of understanding scripture, something that Jesus tells us and told his disciples in Acts chapter one and verse five, which uh, we would not know this without scripture and without Jesus telling us these things. But he mentions this in verse 5 of Acts chapter 1. For John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is essential in our understanding scripture and what God is doing. The Holy Spirit is also about a promise that was prophesied back in the book of Ezekiel where he prophesied, I will change their heart. I will give them a new heart, a new spirit to dwell within them. A heart that's not stony, but a heart that's made out of flesh. 
So Jesus speaks of baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is speaking of. And we, and we see it in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. We see it in our own personal lives with our own personal baptisms, not in the same dramatic way in which uh, on the day of Pentecost in one sense, but in the same sense, a very dramatic change in our life that we see through the Holy Spirit. Now, also, in terms of understanding Scripture, understanding the hope that Scripture brings to us, I want to read a little bit of what the Apostle Paul quotes in terms of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul begins talking about his own preaching and teaching. He says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you with elegance or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. So here we find in what we read in scripture, the New Testament scripture, the apostle Paul talking about the testimony of God and also about what the Holy Spirit teaches us. It is with this in mind that I want to read a little bit more for us and skipping down here to verse 7. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for your glory before time began. Wow, that's, that's quite a statement that he's making about the Holy Spirit even before time began. Now that just tells us something that we might know, not know otherwise. There was a time when there was no time before time began. God has made time for us because that's how we function. We function in time. Again, in a conversation, uh, someone was talking about how that we can guide ourselves by the stars in terms of latitude. We can do that. And, but early sailors could not navigate could not get navigate until they could fix time on longitude because you cannot fix fix that otherwise. Longitude does not do that, but time does until they could develop a clock that would help them to circum uh, you know event uh, circumvent circum you know go around the world. Thank you, thank you. I need some timely information there before time get in. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is, and again, he's quoting scripture. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of the one who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. And so we need scripture to help us in that. And that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4. Now what we read in Timothy, in Paul's instruction to Timothy, it is profitable for doctrine. Scripture is profitable for doctrine. So where would we go doctrinally if it weren't for scripture? Where would we be? Well, when we think, of, and the word for doctrine simply means teachings, and most importantly, the teachings of God that are eternal. So I want to take a look at some of the teachings of Jesus with some basic assumptions that we're going to touch on in terms of Scripture. So when we think about where did Jesus get his doctrine? Where did it come from? Where did Jesus get his teachings? John chapter 4, verse 7, 14 through 18. This is what we read. So this is important. Jesus answered. And of course, 
their question, the people who were questioning him said, well, how do you know these things? You didn't go to Harvard. You didn't go to Yale. You didn't go to Princeton. You didn't go, you go to Stanford. You didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. How do you know these things? Where did you get this learning? And Jesus responded, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. Now, so, wow, that ought to ring a bell in our brains. It is not his own teaching. Now, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to learning, when it comes to living life, we can take a page from Jesus and say, well, you know, it isn't what I have learned. It isn't my teaching. It, it came from, rather in our case, it came from Jesus. Where did Jesus get it? He says, it came from the one who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Now, if we choose to do his will, scripture helps us to recognize that in life, in the world in which we live, there are only two choices. We talked about that. Scripture helps us to realize this, and what Moses said, God says, I set before you this day life and death, blessings and cursings, choose life. There are only, those are the only two cho choices. We have God's way or we have the devil's way. Those are the choices. And the, the devil's way has a, a broad buffet of choices that we can choose from. God has a straight and narrow and it is within his will that he wants us to live. To find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So in this, we learn another lesson from scripture. It is about doing what God's will is for us to do and actually doing it and see where it leads us and guides us. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you a law and yet... Not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? This is an interest. Here are people, again, who read scripture, and the, the, their bottom line of this is that they are trying to kill the Messiah. So this, again, scripture can mislead us. We can be misled by that, and they were. Now, so let's take another uh, look at Jesus' truth. This is also in the book of John, John chapter 14, verse 23 through 26. In verse 23, Jesus tells us this. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. So the love of God, the love of Christ, is based upon the things that Jesus teaches and has taught them. When we look at the world in which we live, the teachings of Jesus, for what they are, are not well received and will not well received at all. Now, the teachings of, and I'm going to use little g for God, the teachings of God are well received by the world. You know, kind of this overarching God, all of that, which does not leave us to the big G. God, the God that Jesus talks about, that Jesus reveals. So he says, you obey my teachings. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. So when we're looking at scripture, we have to realize, well, where does it come from? And what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, they are God-breathed. They come from God, the one who sent me. All this I have spoken while I'm still with you. But now here's another important part for us to understand 
because God hasn't left us alone. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So here again is the involvement of the Holy Spirit in our life to understand what God wants us to understand for, um, for our well-being, that he helps us in, in, in terms of the Holy Spirit. Now, one other verse here in John chapter 12, verse 44 through verse 50. Here is what Jesus said. Then Jesus cries out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now, how, how does this apply to 2 Timothy chapter 3, well, verse 17? We are created for a perfect work that God has created in us. And I think it's in about verse 12 of that same chapter that the Apostle Paul is talking about his manner of life, that we do not stay in darkness, and scripture brings us out of darkness. As a person hears my words, he does, if he does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. And there is a judge, a one who, who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I do, verse 44, nine rather, for I did not speak my own accord, but the father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. So scripture is also helping us to realize that what we say and how we say it is God directed. I know that his command leads to eternal life. This is what Jesus is saying about where this leads. It leads to the eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it. We speak the truth in love. So let's take a look then with that thought in mind at some historical events that again help us to understand uh, that speak to lessons for all of us in terms of scripture. I would guess that the majority of the world laughs and scoffs at the idea that there was a Noah and that there was a flood. And that, you know, all life was basically all life is put there was wiped out. Now, Matthew chapter 24. We go to Matthew chapter 24 because we're we're looking at what Jesus teaches, what he talks about and the like. So in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 through 39, we read this, beginning here in verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is Jesus saying, my words. And why would they not pass away? Because they are eternally true. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, there's a huge lesson in that for, for prophetic buffs. No one knows, not even the angels, not I, but the Father knows. And so to me, to try to figure out or to predict something that we don't know it's kind of going against what Jesus tells us that we don't know, and there's no need to try to figure it out in that regard. As it was in the days, now that, notice what he quotes, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. As in the days of Noah. I know we get all worried sometimes about life and things and people and actions and all, but it, it's Jesus is telling us it's going to be like the days of Noah. Evidently, it's pretty bad back in the days of Noah. 
And so bad that God looked upon him and said, you know, repented him, he even made man. That's how bad the society was. So God has been through that. But it's also say he is going to come again. And there will be judgment. People think, well, wow. We, we will all just waltz into, as it were, the kingdom of God. We can just do anything we want to do. That there's not repercussions to how we live life. I think this says differently uh, and helps us to understand that, hey, uh, get on the right boat. <laughs> the only way to stay afloat in this world is to be on the boat that Jesus built for us. Now, let's take a look at it historically as a character. This is in Luke chapter 17, verses 28 through 32, and this is a character by the name of Lot. So, Jesus is going to talk about him. This is in Luke chapter 17, and verse 28 through 32. Luke 17, now verse 28, and the, these again are words of Jesus. And if you have a red letter Bible, this is quoted as his words. Verse 28, and um, well, it, it begins here in verse 26. Just as it was in the day of Noah, also will be in the days of the Son of Man. People will be eating, drinking, marrying, be giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, so Jesus is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Consequences. Now, what was Sodom and Gomorrah all about? Is it problematic? Was it problematic back then? What was the result of that? Well, they were destroyed. But there's also Lot and, and, and it goes on more. It will be just like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof on his house with his goods inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for nothing. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now, remember Lot's life, wife. What was the problem with Lot's wife? She did what God told her not to do. She looked back. She, back at the old Days, that what she was leaving, what she was thinking that she was giving up and all of those things. It is very easy for us to look back on life and think, look what all that we have given up and the like. Now, there's another example and I have it in here and it's a little different so that we might be careful about all of this. We see a world that goes its own way, does its own thing, goes against what God has created and what God has designed. But I want to talk a little bit about Abraham. This is Genesis 18, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase this. God is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, in essence, to him, God, would you spare them for 50? And God agrees. Abraham comes back and says, but what if there is only 45? And God agrees. Lord, what if there is only 40? And God agrees. Abraham keeps negotiating with God and negotiating with God. And finally, he gets down, Abraham gets down to 10. And God agrees. But then God says, I'm going to go down and see if this is the way that it is. And then you read Genesis chapter 19. My point to us in this lesson in scripture is not to say, God, wipe them out. 
I think we have to have an attitude that Abraham had. Jesus makes the, the comment as well to scribes and Pharisees. It is more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment. We have to be careful. I'm just giving us a warning from scripture and an approach that Abraham had. Also, it's an approach that God had. God has put up with the sin of mankind and been so patient with us for so long. And we all have sinned. We, we, we've got to be careful in that. Now, am I saying that it's right, the way people live? No. Sin is not the way we want to live. This is why we're called to Scripture and to live a life that seeks the righteousness of God. Another point, and for sake of time, I'm just going to refer, this is a historical point in John chapter 6. The historical point is that Jesus is saying to them, and the people are saying, you know, we got bread from heaven. We got manna from heaven. All of these things. And Jesus says, I. And this was for 40 years, six days a week, with a special thing on Friday, with it not being around on, on the Sabbath day back for them. And people being punished for trying to go out and collect it. But for 40 years, God provided for them in the wilderness. Then Jesus says, that example is, I am the manna, the true manna, the true bread from heaven. In this then, that leads us to understand that there was a historical time in which the manna, which God is attesting, or Jesus is attesting to the fact there was a wilderness, there was a manna from heaven, there was a provision by God, and then Jesus is telling us he is the manna, and he gives us this example in, in the outline prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. But it is this bread of communion that connects us to God. Can you imagine when that manna shows up? It's a connection between them and God, and they are fed and they are taken care of. The connection that we have with God is what we call communion. We take of the bread, and we take of the wine, and we have a communion with God. This is a powerful, powerful statement about communion because Jesus says, unless you take of this bread and you drink of this wine, you have no life in you. If you do, you have eternal life. Powerful, powerful statement. Also, with that thought in mind, I want to read Luke chapter 20, verses 34 through 38. Because we live in a world where we are, tend to be self-centered, all of us, and that's why we read from Romans 15, that those who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. But in Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 34, we read this. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. And he's talking about some things, and again, it's, it's understanding that changes our life and who we are. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children. These are words from Jesus, since they are children of the resurrection. So we find Jesus here, we're talking about historical events. He's talking about a resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. This is a resurrection. This is a hope of life. Oh, this is testimony to Moses. This is t testimony to the burning bush. These are testimonies to the things that people might laugh at, but Jesus uses them. Jesus also ha helps us to understand in terms of scripture, the apostles' authority. In Matthew chapter 10, now why is this important? Because it is basically the apostles who write to us what we call the New Testament. And so what does he say about his apostles in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 14? He says this about them when they go out to preach the gospel. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, 
Shake the dust off your feet when you leave the home or the town. I tell you the truth, it is more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that town. But it is, it's about listening to what the apostles have to say. They are the ones who are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the writings that they wrote, and we listen to their words. Now, with that thought in mind, and I know we're all over the place, I'm, but I, I hope that you can kind of bond this together. In John chapter 13 and verse 13, here's what Jesus says. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, happy are you if you do them. This is what Jesus is telling us. I am not referring to all of you. I know those whom I have chosen. Now, this is another encouraging point that he has chosen. But this is to fill the, fulfill the scripture. Now, all of a sudden, the importance of this takes effect. This, I do this to do what the scriptures tell me that I need to do, what the Father would tell me to fulfill scripture. Jesus was busy fulfilling scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And and again, these are prophetic writings in life. So what we find, though, is Jesus fulfills the word of God, not only the word of God, but the will of God. With that thought in mind, let's read from Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, and you're very familiar with this because this is on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus is, is there. This is after his death, after his resurrection, but in Luke chapter 24 and verse 19, we, we read this. Jesus asked them the silly question, what things, you know, what, what, what's been going on? And uh, so they, they tell him about Jesus, about his death, all of those things, and they had lost heart. They had lost heart in what scripture had told them because Jesus died. Now there's a valuable lesson in all of that for us. It can appear to us that the Lord is dead. The Lord has gone away. He's not near. But there's scripture that helps us to hold on and to have hope. And it's scripture then that changes our whole attitude. So we begin here now in verse 25. Then he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, brethren, we are encouraged by what the prophets have spoken, the positive things. And now, and then especially so if we have a focus in Scripture as Jesus had. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? There are reasons, there are times. And Jesus is explaining that. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Scripture is about Christ. It is about God. And then when we read, for example, and it's not in your notes, but Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, you know, in times past, God has spoken to the prophets in various, but in these times, he's spoken to us by his son. So Jesus is giving authority for the words of the prophets or scripture. John chapter 3 and verse 31, as I, again, verse 31, here's what, we, here's what we find John talking, John the Baptist talking about. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who comes is from the earth, belongs to the earth, and speaks as one of the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony what he has seen and what he has heard. So Jesus is quite the authority. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. 
For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Again, this is about Jesus, uh, John testifying of Jesus. Now, how important is scripture in life, in Jesus' life? Well, John chapter 12, now in verse 26 and 27. Because, see, scripture has a power on our life to guide us, to direct us, and to help us. John chapter 12, verse 26, here's what, what we read here and understand. Whoever serves me must follow me. I mean, these are words of Jesus. If we're going to serve Jesus, we must follow him. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? This is powerful in this regard, brethren. Jesus is facing a very difficult time and his heart is troubled. You know, there is a sadness around all that he had to go through. Father, save me from this hour. And we, we all have, I mean, quite a lesson from the words of Jesus. No, and this is what I love. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Brother, if we can think even in this day, it is for this very hour for which I have come. Where we are in this moment, where God is leading us, guiding us, directing. Jesus was obedient to scripture even till death and through death and the like. So now, 2 Timothy, Paul writes in verse 16, it's for instruction in righteousness. We think about righteousness in this regard, but let's listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We seek not our own righteousness, because without scripture, we would not know that without the Holy Spirit working in our lives and effectually changing our lives, as the Apostle Paul said, you know, the life I now live, it's not me. It is Christ who lives his life in me and through me and loves me. So with that thought in mind, I want to just go back here in conclusion to John chapter 6. At a very difficult time when Jesus was talking about the manna from heaven, you must eat of his flesh, drink of his blood and all of that. And the difficulty that came from, from that statement that Jesus made to them. It begins here now in verse 63 is where I want to begin. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him or draw him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And then Simon Peter answered this. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We are called to be holy. God gives us scriptures. He gives us direction. So scripture, Jesus, and doctrine, and how we live our life, where would we be without the word of God? Our Lord and Savior. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for this opportunity. We thank you for your love, for your Bible. We just pray, Father, that we can truly follow those words of life, to love our Lord with all of our heart and mind and being. Thank you so very much for the hope and salvation you give to us. Thank you for your son 
And in his name we do praise and give you thanks. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend the local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.